Good afternoon, everyone. It is Saturday, January the 11th, 2020. It is currently 3.18 p.m. Central Time. Well, if you listen to a lot of my recordings and pay close attention to how they sound, you're probably thinking to yourself right now, well, wait a minute. I don't, I don't think he's in his study at his house where he does a lot of his recordings. And if you're thinking that, you would be absolutely right. I am not in my study at my home. No, I got in my car and I drove here to Victory Baptist Church. If you're listening carefully, you're probably thinking, well, he's not, he's not back there in the sound booth using the Blue Yeti mic. And you would be right again, I am not. I have the wireless mic on that I use when I preach sermons. And I am walking up and down, well, the middle aisle of the church. I decided to come out to the church this Saturday afternoon for, well, some time for spiritual meditation, Bible study, prayer, just to turn my focus on the things of God, preparing a little bit for Sunday, for tomorrow. And in my time, while I was out here, um, I don't really know how I ended up at this scripture, but I did. And um, it's Luke chapter 22, if you can open a Bible and turn there. Luke chapter 22. I'm kind of pausing a little bit because I, I'm, 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 I'm questioning if this is a good idea. Right? Because I know I'm going to say some things here that can be somewhat controversial. And, and maybe not controversial. I think I, I'm going to say some things here that are going to be possibly misunderstood. But let me make this very clear. All right? uh, because I want to make sure you understand this. I, this is, we're going to kind of consider this my devotional time, all right? And if you know my devotional recordings, you know what I do. I, I, I come across a scripture. I, it's time for my devotional time. I pick a scripture. I have something, and I basically hit the record button or the go live button. Now, I can't hit the go live button because our church is still in, you know, the 1800s out here in the middle of nowhere. We still do not have an internet connection. We are trying to get one. Maybe someday, maybe in the year 2030, Victory Baptist Church will, will you know, catch up with the rest of the world. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're trying. Once I, once I get that, I can, I can actually hit the go live button. But uh, when I do my devotional t- studies, I either hit the record button or the go live button. And I, and I just have my devotional in real time. In real time. I, I'm just thinking out loud and discussing things out loud. I get a lot of emails criticizing the approach. I get some emails loving the approach. And then I get, well, silence from a lot of other people, all right? So um, I, this is one of those situations where I, I was sitting here, and I, next thing I know, I found myself in Luke chapter 22. And when I got to verse 31 and verse 32, well, verse 31, verse 32 Verse 33 and verse 34, probably 31 to 34. When I read these verses, I mean, and you're, you're familiar with this if you, if you read the Bible all the time, if you're a student of the Bible, if you love the scriptures, if you study the scriptures, you're very aware of that experience where you know a passage, like you know it so well, you've studied it and read it and heard a million sermons on it, but all of a sudden you read it one more time and boom, you, 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 you see it from a different perspective. You get a... You get a different, uh, there's a different focus for you. Now, again, that's not saying, that's not saying you come up with a brand new interpretation. You just, you, you know what the verse says, but th- you just see something in it. You see something different than, than you noticed before. And this was one of those situations where I read the passage and all of a sudden I was like, boom, wait a minute. There's some, there's some things here. That, that, I, uh, that I'm thinking about. Now, again, here's the dangerous part, though. I, I haven't got this all figured out yet. So you need to understand, this is, this is you, like, this is basically me sitting here in the church on a Saturday. You drive by, you see the car, and then, well, I'll go over to the door. And all of a sudden, you walk over to the door, because I don't have the door locked. You just open it up. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? Come on in. And you come in and you say, what are you doing? I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Luke chapter 22. Well, hey, can I join you in your, in your uh, devotional time? Yes, you can. So this is, this is the same kind of situation that I do a lot of times at home. Come on in, sit down, 
and let's talk about it. Now, I, again, talk about it. I'm going to throw out ideas. I don't ha- I'm not throwing out anything definitive. I'm inviting you into the process. All right? Now, what I need to do, well, I have a pencil in my hand. I need, well, if I, if I need it, I'll go back and get, get, go back there because I'm you know, in the middle of recording. Um, I will go back there and grab a notebook if I need to write anything down. But let's, let's look at it, all right? Luke chapter 22. All right? And, I, and, I, and I, I know some of you are like, man, you give that kind of warning every time. Because I have to give that warning because you don't get all the emails going, well, why didn't you say this? And why didn't you say that? And, and your thoughts weren't very well organized because... You didn't listen to, you didn't pay attention to what you're listening to. You're not listening to a sermon. You're not listening to a, 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 a planned out study. You're listening to someone having their devotional time. And I would assume that if you have a devotional time on a regular basis, your devotional, when you're going through it, your devotional study, it's not all planned out and organized. So this is the same kind of process. But here we go. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, So Jesus is speaking. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. All right, let's stop right here in verse 31. Let's stop right here. Jesus is speaking to Peter. And he's telling Peter of a spiritual reality that Peter himself is obviously not aware of. Jesus is aware of it. He knows this. Peter doesn't. And he reveals this to Peter. Peter, Satan, right? the devil, our spiritual enemy, the one that roams about like a like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, which Peter will be the one who writes those words down later, right? Um, Peter, Satan hath desired to have you. Satan has a desire to have you, to take you, and he wants to sift you as wheat. Wow, that's, a, that's an interesting you know, concept. Now we could get into, okay, desire to have you. We could talk, we could look up the word have. What does that mean? To sift you as wheat. Um, What does, what exactly does that uh, refer to? And exactly how can we understand that? Give me one second here. I'm just looking at something. I don't know if there'll be an entry here. Give me one second. I just, I saw a Bible dictionary right here. And I'm looking. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be. Let me look at one other. I was hoping there would be something. All right, let me see. There's another place that tells me to look in the Bible dictionary. I know this is exciting stuff, but that's okay. Look here. Um, I was looking for this idea of sifting wheat. Um, They got an entry here in the Bible dictionary about wheat. They don't really... um, go into great detail about it. So we, we could look that up and we could really, we could really take, take that apart. But look, so, so, hey, sorry for the little delay there, a little distraction there, but I wanted to look up just in case I could add something to this. In my own, again, my own personal uh, devotional time. So this is what we'll do. There's, there's, some, there's, there's some things there that we could really study to really add to this that I may need to come back to on my own and I would challenge you on your own. And again, those two things, what does it mean to have you and to, that he may sift you as wheat? What is that, that sifting process? Um, and I don't have another translation here. Let me see here. On I'm looking around. 
Now, I think all, the only translation I currently have here in my hand is the King James. It would be interesting to see how others uh, translate that. But you get, this, you get the concept. Jesus knows something Peter doesn't. J- Jesus is aware of what Satan is trying to do. He is aware of it. He knows it. And he tells Peter. All right? He tells Peter that Satan is after you. Satan is coming for you. He's, he's going to, he, this sifting process, he, he wants to put you through it. He wants to do this to you. All right? Now that, that speaks of Jesus' knowledge of a spiritual reality that Peter doesn't. He knows. I want to just, I'm going to emphasize that. Jesus knows. Next verse. But... I have prayed for thee. All right. Jesus knows that Satan is after Peter. Jesus knows that Satan seeks to have Peter. Jesus knows this. Now, on one hand, that gives me great comfort. Okay, Jesus knows when Satan is after me. Jesus knows when sin is after me. Jesus knows when temptation is after me. Jesus knows. That is good comfort, That right? Not only does he know, he does something else. He has prayed for thee. He prays for Peter. And we can speak of the intercessory ministry of Jesus. Jesus making intercession for us. He knows the spiritual realities that we cannot see. He knows what Satan is trying to do. He knows where temptation is. He knows where sin is. He knows. And he has prayed. Now, this is what struck me. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did he pray? If he knows Satan is after him, and he knows what Satan is attempting to do to him, why would Jesus pr- not simply pray, Lord, or pray to his father, Father, stop Satan from doing this. Stop this from happening. We know that Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Look at verse 34. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that, before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Jesus, he knows Satan is out to get Peter, right? He knows he wants to sift him as wheat. He knows that Peter is going to deny, that Peter is going to deny Jesus. Jesus knows this, that Peter is going to deny him, not once, not twice, but three times. He knows this. He prays. Now you would think the prayer would be, Father, stop Satan, stop this from happening, keep Peter from denying me three times. Keep him from committing such an evil sin. Keep him from doing such. Wouldn't that be the prayer you would expect? I mean, if I knew, if I know, if I know you, and I know that this Saturday night you're going to go out and do something that is going to be hurtful to your spiritual life, it's going to hurt other people, that you're going to commit a great sin. I hope I would pray, Lord, stop this from happening. Keep this from happening. Intervene. Right? God is all-powerful. He intervenes in many cases, right? He does lots of things. He intervened on when Paul was on, uh, you know, on, uh, he was out persecuting uh, Christians. God intervened. Right? He intervened with Pharaoh. There's lots of situations where, when Joseph was going to put away Mary. God intervened. So you would think that what we would expect to happen is that Jesus would pray that the Father would stop it from happening. But clearly, he doesn't pray for it to stop. In fact, we're given some insight here. We're given some very, a very interesting insight here. 
but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. He prays that his faith doesn't fail. Not that he won't deny, but that his faith will not fail. Now, we've got to be very careful here, because if we say, well, when he denied him three times, his faith did fail. Okay, well, if that's the case, then Jesus' prayer wasn't answered. That would seem odd. Yes? One God, three distinct persons? Are you, is there, a, 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 like, a, how do we, how do we get in? That, that raises lots of questions here, right? Are we saying that Jesus' prayer wasn't answered? Or are we saying that even though he denied Jesus three times, his faith did not ultimately fail? He denied, he sinned, he showed a lack of faith, he showed a weak faith, he showed fear, but his faith did not fail. That was the prayer. But note this. He prayed that his faith would not fail. And then note this. Very interesting. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now that converted, some people may read that, well, when you become saved, as if Peter is not saved. But Peter's already been the one confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And that this was revealed to him by the Father. Uh, that I, I don't think we can say that Peter wasn't saved. This idea of converted. In fact, I had, let me see, I think I have a commentary here on my iPad. Let me look here. Yeah, um, well, let me pull that back up. Look here, I think I have one right here. Um, Yeah, they don't offer, I thought they offered the idea of this word when you're converted. Let's go to a different commentary. Go to a different one. Yeah, okay, yeah. The word converted in Luke twenty two thirty two 32 means turned around. Peter was already a saved man, but he would soon start going in the wrong direction and would have to be turned around. He would not lose the gift of eternal life, but he would disobey the Lord and jeopardize his discipleship. Actually, all of the disciples would forsake Jesus, but Peter would also deny him. It is a humbling lesson for us. So the idea is, we could read it this way, when thou art turned around, when you are turned around, Strengthen thy brethren. Now, this is an amazing thing to really consider. I want you to really think with me here. Because what we, what we discover here is this. Jesus knows what's going to happen. He prays for Peter, but he doesn't pray for, this, for the situation not to occur, for the event not to occur. He doesn't pray for that. He prays, for, he prays that he, his faith would not fail, right? And then... It seems to be a part of the prayer, at least kind of the way I read it, that when he is turned around, that there will be a turning around, that he will then strengthen his brethren. This is almost how it's happening. Jesus knows it's going to happen. He prays that his faith does not completely fail, right? That he maintains his faith. Somehow it's, it's going to be tested. It's going to show weakness. He's going, he's going to fail. He's going to fall. He's going to deny. But Jesus is already praying for the restoration. He's already restoring him. He is restoring him before the fall. He is literally offering restoration before the failure. This is pre-restoration 
right? This is not post-restoration. I'm go- after you fall, I'm going to restore you. He's literally offering the restoration right now. What? Once you turn around, you're going to fall. But once you do, once you turn around, strengthen the brethren. That's a, an amazing concept here. And, there, and this leads to all kinds of questions. All right? You can probably hear, you can probably already come up with some of these questions on your own. Let me, let me just think of some of them out loud. Just, let's just, and I don't have a notebook to write these down, so I may, I may not repeat these the right way, but you can, you can try to write these down. But at least consider this. The obvious question I have is why didn't he pray to stop this from happening? He knows what Satan is trying to do. He knows what Peter is going to do. Why doesn't he stop it from happening? Now, there's not a lot of easy questions. There's not a lot of easy answers here. Because if you're not careful, you could state it this way. Well, clearly, within God's sovereignty, Peter's failure was decreed and ordained. Now, if you're not careful, you see what you can do. Well, then when you fall, when I fall, when I fail, when you fail, well, it was a part of God's ordained sovereign plan, and so we feel justified in it. Make this very clear. Whether it's a part of, a part of God's ordained plan doesn't justify the behavior. The behavior is still condemned. It was foreordained, predetermined that sinful men with evil hands would take Jesus and crucify him. Just because that was a part of God's eternal sovereign plan does not bring, justify what the men did. But it demonstrates that that Jesus knew he doesn't ask it to stop, so clearly it's a part of the plan. Now, we have a hard time looking at people's failures as a part of God's divine plan, what we tend to do is look at it, you messed up, now you face the consequences. Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be consequences. I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is sometimes we have to go, well, wait a minute, maybe this was a part of God's plan. Now, if, if, if and when we say a part of God's plan, he's not, listen, he's not, he's not promoting sin, He's not calling for sin. He's allowing the sin to transpire and he's going to utilize that sin for his ultimate plan and glory. Peter falls. Peter's pride is, I think, let's just say that Peter is humbled by his failure and then God uses him to strengthen the brethren and then he's a major part of the early church and then we obviously get the epistles. It's a, it's a powerful it's a powerful section. So the obvious the obvious question is why didn't he do anything and it seems to be the obvious answer is God, this was a part of God's plan. This was a part of God's plan. A second it's not really a question but a second thought. Well, well I'll, may, I'll put it in a question form. Is restoration a part of our theology? We sometimes have a theology of condemnation. We sometimes have a good theology of discipline. But do we have a good theology of restoring someone back to a place of usefulness? Is there there hope for someone who fails? Now, depending, you can read lots of books on failure within spiritual life. Right, um, you've got books. We'll say, okay, if you if you committed this sin, this sin, this sin, this sin, but you did it before you're converted, and then you're converted, then you don't. Then there are no consequences. In other words, if you got married and divorced, and then remarried, and then you want to be a pastor, that's okay because you did it before you were saved. You committed adultery, you committed fornication, you committed murder, but you did it before you were saved. Well, you can become a pastor. Everything is good. Now, if you commit any of those acts after you're a pastor, then many people say, now you're disqualified forever. Now, everyone would know there would be a temporary disqualification because there's got to be at least a a period of of trying to get you restored back to a a place. Um, 
But we have to have, we, there has to be a, a, a doctrine of restoration. And here, Jesus literally is, uh, is restoring, is basically pre-restoring Peter before the fall. Now, we know that there is a post-restoration later on when uh, Jesus confronts Peter and he says, Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. That three times, for the three times he denied him. There is a restoration. There is a restoration. And if you think about it, Peter, I mean, I, I, we would have to count this out, but if Jesus is arrested, Peter denies him on the night that Jesus is arrested, right? If the, if the next day, if the next day Jesus is crucified, right, then Jesus uh, uh, raises from the dead on the third day, it's not long after that that Peter is restored, it's not like Jesus comes along and says, hey, now, you need, you need this period of time. He restores him relatively quick because in a roundabout way, he restored him before he even fell, before, even, before Peter even, you know, messed up. Now, obviously, we cannot operate under those things because we don't know, as Jesus knew beforehand. I think what determines the restoration is the, is, the, is the the state of the person after the fall. What is it? Is it repentant? Is it broken? Is it humbled? How, how, how is the person act? But we need to have that doctrine of restoration. We have a question here of, of why didn't Jesus intervene to stop it? And it seems the only answer is because this was a part of it. And it doesn't excuse it. Make that very clear. I am not excusing anyone's sin or anyone's failure. I'm not excusing yours. I'm not excusing mine. I'm not excusing anyone. But obviously sometimes, I mean, God could intervene in many cases to stop lots of failure and sin. He could intervene. And he doesn't have to do it in some massively supernatural way. He could have just kept Peter. I mean, it would have been an easy, there could have been a, just normal, it would have looked like normal circumstances that could have kept Peter from going and, and following Jesus. He could, there could have been just normal circumstances that would have occurred that would have been preordained by God that would have turned Peter from following and he could have never have denied him. He never would have denied him. Would his, would his pride have ever been broken? The sin was used by God to break his pride. In fact, look at verse 33 of Luke 22. You see Peter's attitude. After he is, um, you know, I have prayed to thee um, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And this is what Peter said. Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. I don't need your restoration. I don't need your prayer. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to die. Yeah. It doesn't last. That pride, that pride comes crumbling down in the face of, wait, don't, aren't you with Jesus? Don't you know him? Next thing you know, that pride comes crumbling down as Peter denies him once, denies him twice, denies him three times. And then he is broken. So let's let's do this. Why did Jesus not pray for this to stop? Clearly it was a part of God's plan. And clearly we can see that it was used by God to make Peter better. And it's hard to believe that sometimes failure could be literally the means God uses to further our our sanctification. But God uses it. So why why did uh, Jesus not pray for this to stop? Because it was a part of his plan and he used it. All right. Number two. Restoration has to be a part of our theology. Has to be a part of our theology. I think sometimes we forget that. And number three, and I kind of just hinted at this. Do you see failure as a vital part of sanctification? I think I have a tendency to look at sanctification as 
okay, if, if you were watching me, I'm standing in the back of the church, right? And let's just say this is the beginning of my Christian life. And I see sanctification is, and I'm just taking a step. I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. I'm moving right down the center aisle, headed towards the pulpit. I'm just moving forward, forward, forward. And if I fall, if I commit a horrible sin, then I perceive that almost as starting back over. But is it possible that the failure actually is advancing us in sanctification, is actually improving us. Now, I think the only way it does is how we respond to the failure. The response to the failure is key. Failure in and of itself does not advance you. Failure in and of itself does not move you forward. But Jesus was praying that his faith would not fail. And praying, listen, he was praying that, look, you're getting ready. Satan is getting ready to come after you. He's getting ready to sift you. But I am praying that you, there will not be a complete failure in this and that there wasn't. Peter failed. His faith failed temporarily, like in that instance, but his faith was still intact. And, and so what happened is the failure broke him. The failure shattered the pride, but it literally advanced Peter forward in his spiritual life. Now, it's hard because, because you could sit there and go, man, I remember that time in my life where I messed up bad in my spiritual life, but woohoo! Praise God for it, because it was a good thing. <laughs> All right, But I, you, you don't ever want to be glad you fell. You don't want to ever be glad that you, you, you were the one denying Jesus. You don't want to be the one, you don't want to celebrate that. But you want to celebrate the fact that God in his mercy and in his grace uses failure to advance us spiritually. I'll, I'll end with this. Luke chapter 22, let me read it again, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fell not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee to both, uh, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shall thrice deny that thou knowest me. And let me look here. I was going back to this uh, commentary to see if they had anything here about this sifting process. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't give me what I want there. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, this is what one commentary uh, says. Desired to have you, rather, have obtained you properly, asked and obtained, um, alluding to Job. That's an interesting. Remember when uh, Satan, you know, comes before the Lord and, and, and God mentions, uh, mentions Job and Satan is like, hey, he only serves you because you do all these things. Let me, basically, let me have him. Let me do what I want and he will curse you. I think they're, they're saying that this is alluding to that same concept. Satan had come for Peter to have him, to, to be able to do what he wants to him. And when, uh, when he solicited and obtained that he might s- uh, sift him as wheat, insinuating as the accuser of the brethren that he would find chaff enough in his religion if deed there was any wheat at all. So it's the idea, almost this, almost giving the picture and I know I didn't say this at the beginning, but I just, just thought of this commentary to look up. It's almost this idea, Satan comes and says, hey, let me have Peter, because I want to sift him as wheat, and I will prove to you that there's no wheat, it's all chaff. There's no wheat there, and he gets Peter, and well, he finds the chaff. He finds it. 
weak, fearful, denies three times. Jesus knows this is what's going to happen. Knows he's going to sift him. He even knows what he's going to find. He, Jesus knows that the, the, the chaff will be found. He knows it. Hey, they, they let Satan have Peter. Satan does this thing. The chaff is revealed. But before it's even do- done, this is what Jesus will not allow to happen. He will not allow Peter's faith to completely fail. And he will. He will not allow Peter to be completely destroyed. But he will, is restoring him even before the sifting takes place. Even before it takes place. He's going to use the sifting process. He's going to use the fact that chaff is going to be found to break Peter, to humble him, and then use Peter to strengthen the brethren. A man, he's going to use the man who denies him three times. He's going to use that man. Not the man who, he's going to use the other man in different ways, but he chooses to use Peter in that way. And you would think, why use Peter? He's the one, and then what happens? The day of Pentecost, who preaches? The failure. The failure. And why was the failure preaching on the day of Pentecost and not someone else? One of those other people who did not fall. Shouldn't they be preaching? He used the failure because God is demonstrating his grace and mercy in restoring the failure for his purpose. There's just a lot right there to unpack. A lot there to unpack. Maybe at some point that will turn into a sermon, but, well, I'll just stop right there. Let's pray. Let's pray. Um, Lord God, we just thank you that through the means of technology, I have the ability to, to share these thoughts Lord, I pray that nothing was said that was uh, not correct or not accurate. If I, if, I, if I failed in any way, please forgive me. But um, I think there are, hopefully there's lots of people who will hear this, who we've all had that period of time of being sifted and nothing but chaff being discovered. And we find ourselves, uh, fell, we find ourselves denying you and our actions and our thoughts and our words and our deeds. We, we, we find ourselves as failures. I am thankful that you do restore and that you use the failure sometimes even to advance us in our sanctification. But Lord, how we respond to it is what ultimately matters. And I just pray that we would give this much meditation and thought. Thank you, Lord. And we just ask that you bless the study of this passage. Um, And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.